Open your Bibles with me this morning to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And I'm going to read, well, I guess it's a, a kind of a lengthy text, but you just have to have the story. And this is probably a story that you're familiar with. I want to invite you to go with me to Jacob's well. I'm going to talk about Jacob's well. Jacob's well. I'm at, uh, we'll start at verse four. Verse, the first three verses just give some background. Um, Jesus is going, he's left Judea and is going back to Galilee because as it turns out, there are some Pharisees that are trying to stir up trouble for him. <laughs> and so he finds out about it and he goes back, leaves Judea to go back to Galilee. I'm at verse 4 of John 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. And I'm going to get into this a little bit, but verse 4 has nothing to do with geography. So he, he didn't have to go there because of the route to get to Galilee, he had to go there because there was a person he had to meet. Verse 5, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired as he was, as he was Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? And his disciples, this is in parentheses, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So Jesus is sitting there by himself when this woman by herself comes out to draw water. And he says, will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And again, this is in parentheses. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. There's even more to it than that. And I'll explain in a bit. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. And indeed, the water I, I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What a promise. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She thought he was talking about physical water. He's talking about spiritual water. Or as one song calls it, he's talking about holy water. <laughs> Verse 16, he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Boy, can you imagine the look on her face? Sir, the woman said, I can see that you, you are a prophet. <laughs> Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. I think it's interesting how she tries to change the subject. 
Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us just like you just did. And then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. And just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman with a woman. And I might add, especially a Samaritan woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? But look at verse 28. When, as soon as Jesus said, I who speak to you am he, then leaving her water jug, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah, the Christ? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. And then Jesus has a conversation with his disciples as he sees the crowd coming from town. And if you go to verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town, uh, the, he has this conversation with his disciples who urge him to eat something. And he says, I have food to eat you don't know of. And he tells them about the harvest. And he says, look, look, they are ripe for harvest, he says in verse 35. I think he says that as the crowd is coming. Look, they are ripe for harvest. And in verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. And so I'll finish that. I'll probably read the rest of it by the time I get finished. Would you bow your heads with me? Let me say a prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you came to this world to save, to seek and to save those who are lost. You came for the sick and the wounded and the desperate and the hurting, and you are near to those who are of a broken spirit. You, you literally came for people just like this woman that we read about. And I thank you, Lord, that you came by my well one day. And I pray, Lord, that today you would soften our hearts and, and you know, plow up the soil of our hearts and let this word be good seed planted in good soil. And let all who hear it be changed by it. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Oh, say it a little bit louder. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you. You know, those of you who know me personally know that I am by nature an introvert. I've actually almost had arguments with people about this who maybe don't know me as well as they think when I say, well, I'm by nature an introvert. And they go, oh, pastor, no, you're not. <laughs> um, yes, I was. I by nature am an introvert. I have learned to be more extroverted when I need to be. And the Lord had to help me with that when I surrendered to his calling on my life to pulpit ministry. Um, I had to have a talk with him about that. I said, God, if you want me to do this the rest of my life, you're going to have to help me not to get sick at my stomach every Saturday night as I anticipate Sunday morning. <laughs> and, uh, and he has helped me with that. Um, I, I grew up, you know, playing music and I could... I could play the drums in front of thousands of people and be perfectly comfortable as long as I didn't have to say anything. 
but I was not one growing up that liked the spotlight or enjoyed uh, speaking in public. Now, now you can even watch me on TV. So God has helped me a lot. He's helped me with this. But, you know, one of the things that I've always disliked as an introvert is finding myself in a socially awkward situation. And I'm not even sure extroverts enjoy that. But that's just particularly, it's very uncomfortable for me. Have you, have you ever attended a, a, maybe a dinner party or a work party or some social event um, only to find yourself seated at a table with a bunch of people who probably don't really even want you sitting at their table? Has that ever happened to you? Well, with Thanksgiving coming up, I hope that's not the case when you go to visit family or they come to visit you. Um, but maybe, maybe if you haven't had that one, have you ever gone to the store to grab a few items? You're just going to run in and run out, and you round a corner and come face to face with someone that you know does not like you. And there you are, face to face. It's even, it's even almost impossible not to say, well, hi, how are you? Um, somebody that you try to avoid or maybe someone that tries to avoid you and there you are face to face with man that is so awkward isn't it well it is for me and brother richard thank you <laughs> so the rest of you enjoy it do you you know if it's just a passing moment in time it's not too bad because the awkwardness only lasts for that moment but you know, sometimes you can find yourself in a social situation where the awkwardness lasts the entire evening. Um, and that's just really uncomfortable. And especially so for an introvert. Um, the Lord has helped me with that too. Because, you know, I've had to swim with the sharks a few times, as they say. The Lord has sometimes prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies, as David would say. Um, and, you know, one of the things that adds to the difficulty or the awkwardness of those uncomfortable social situations is when we bring our own personal insecurities to the table with us. So a person who is already struggling with self-esteem issues or, you know, low, low self-confidence or maybe some personal shame or some personal insecurities, those kind of people can find those awkward social encounters even more difficult to endure can't they? Well, today I want to introduce you to just such a person. And, you know, we don't even know her name, but we have the privilege of listening in on a conversation that changed her life. And it takes place in the Samaritan town of Sychar. Notice it's near the plot of ground that Jacob, who is also called Israel in the Old Testament, uh, it's near a place that the Bible says near the, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. That story is in Genesis chapter 48 where uh, Jacob is quite old and he is near the end of his life. And remember his son Joseph who had, his brothers had sold into uh, slavery and he ends up being second in command. And, but his father thought he was dead and eventually they reunite and Joseph finds out his father is close to dying. And so Joseph took his two sons to see Jacob, his father. And the Bible says Jacob rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. And after Jacob had blessed Joseph's sons, the Bible says that, that Israel, who is Jacob, said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your father's. And to you, I give one more ridge of land than to your brothers. 
And he said, it's the ridge I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. Now, all these years later, and I want you to see that God had his servant all those years ago, thousands of years ago, dig a well because God needed a well where this woman would one day meet the Savior. All these years later, the, the, the Samaritan town of Sychar was located near that piece of land, and John 4, verse 6 tells us that Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. So I want to begin this morning. I, I know I've, I've already began. I've laid some groundwork, but I, I want to begin by introducing you to the woman at Jacob's well. And we don't know her name, but we do know quite a bit about her. In fact, I would say that we know more about her than she ever intended to make public. Have you ever had anything embarrassing about yourself or something that you're ashamed of that somebody found out about and made sure it was a public thing? I know, you don't want to admit it. Well, that's how this woman is. And she has perhaps the longest recorded one-on-one -on -one interaction with Jesus uh, more than any other individual in John's gospel, maybe in any of the gospels. This is one of the longest conversations Jesus has one-on-one -on -one with a person, and we get to, we get to be part of it. And so let me tell you what we do know about her, uh, beginning with the fact that she is a Samaritan. As many of you know, Samaritans were a mixed race of Jew and Gentile. And their roots can be traced back to 727 BC when the Assyrians captured the 10 northern tribes and they intermarried the Jews with the Assyrians. Now, that was a violation of God's law, the law of Moses, uh, to intermarry with people um, of other religions. And some people use that scripture to try to argue that it's unbiblical for there to be these interracial marriages or interethnic marriages, and that's not exactly true. Um, the truth is, God didn't want them to marry people who had other gods, God had warned them not to do that lest their Jewish faith become diluted and polluted with the idolatry of those other people. But when they were taken captive, they intermarried, which brought about the, the, the group of people we call the Samaritans. And they were half Jew and they were half not Jew, Gentile. Then when... When the Samaritans could not prove their Jewish genealogy, I don't know if you've ever read the Bible through and noticed there are a lot of genealogies in the Bible. That was very important. Um, for example, people who couldn't prove their genealogy is related to the Aaronic priesthood, the, the relation to Aaron. They couldn't serve as priests in the temple. And when the Samaritans couldn't prove their Jewish genealogy. They were rejected by the Jews. And the animosity grew between the Jews and the Samaritans. And we could say that eventually culture began to cancel them. Now that's kind of a modern term we hear a lot about these days is this cancel culture in which we live. If, you don't, if you're not like us, if you don't agree with everything I say, we'll cancel you. That's kind of become popular, hasn't it? So they weren't pure. They weren't holy. They weren't even good enough to come and worship in Jerusalem. And so eventually the Samaritans built their own temple on Mount Gerizim which gives you some insight into the question that she raises with Jesus in verse 20 about where to worship. You Jews say that the right place to worship is in Jerusalem. 
But we Samaritans have a different place to worship. Well, no wonder. If you weren't welcome in this church, I would expect you'd probably find another church or go start one of your own. So to be certain, Jews hated the Samaritans. In fact, it's been said that the Pharisees prayed that no Samaritan would be raised in the resurrection. Imagine you as a Christian hating someone so much that you prayed that they would never experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wow. So Jews would go out of their way to avoid going to Samaria and out of, out of their way to avoid running into any Samaritans. Now, Jesus, I told you that verse 4 has nothing to do with geography. Jesus could have gone one of two other ways to avoid going through Samaria. And I don't have a map to put up here to show you, so just kind of look up here and follow me a minute. You can either go this way around Samaria, or you can go that way around Samaria. But you don't have to go through Samaria. But through Samaria is exactly where Jesus wanted to go. It was not typically an option for a devout Jew. That's what's so amazing that the Bible says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. It has nothing to do with geography. It has to do with the fact that he went there on purpose. Man, I'm so glad he came and found me on purpose. And something else we know about this woman at Jacob's well is that for whatever reason, hang with me, for whatever reason, she'd been married five times. I don't want to go around the room, and I'm not looking at anybody when I say this, but she may beat all of us in this room. And we know that the man that she currently is with was not her husband. Now that could mean a couple of things. That could mean that she was living with a man out of wedlock, which would be a sin. Or it could mean that the man she was now with was some other woman's husband, which is also a sin. So we don't, we don't know why she had been married five times. But it could have been because one or more of her husbands had died. Or it could be that one or more of her husbands had abandoned her through divorce. Or it may have been some of both, but any of which is bad. And I'm sure it was devastating to this woman's sense of self-worth or self-esteem. You know, I mean, I know things have changed in our culture compared to, to then. Now we live in a day when, I don't know, some people trade spouses like kids used to trade marbles. But in that day and culture, the fact that she has been married five times for whatever reason and was now with a, with a man to whom she was not married would be the epitome of social, of a social outcast. And now after losing five husbands and now living with a man who is not her husband, we can also assume from this that neither does she have any family left like a dad or a brother who could take her in and give her a place to live which would be typical of that day in culture. She's on her own. And we might even shrug our shoulders and say, no wonder she's living with this man. It's about survival. Because her only other option in that day in culture would probably have been prostitution. So she is someone that nobody would want to socialize with. 
Let me, let me make it clear. Other, other women would never invite her out to lunch. And nobody would want her around their husband. Make no mistake, she would be scorned. She would be looked upon with contempt and derision. If she walked into the public market, others would whisper about her and turn away from her. She had no hope of ever being married to anybody respectable in the community. <clears throat> she had nothing to look forward to publicly but embarrassment and shame. Whew. I mean, you start to have a heart for her, don't you? When she came to draw water from the well that day, it was the sixth hour of the day. Now, I've heard some people argue or say, some scholars say that that meant 6 p.m. Well, to a Jew, that would mean it was noon. Now, that's significant, and I want to tell you why. Typically, <clears throat> women would go to draw water early in the morning. And by the way, they would always go together because it was a time of socializing. It was, I guess, what in my day growing up, you know, women used to go to the beauty shop together. My dad was a barber. One thing I can tell you about barber shops is it's a social event. And so was a beauty shop in my day growing up when my mother or someone would go to a beauty shop. Uh, well, going to draw water was a social event. These women would go together and they would spend their time talking with other wives and connecting with friends. Going to the well was a social event. You can imagine the embarrassment and the shame she would have felt with her domestic situation being what it was. And you can certainly understand why she would purposefully wait until the other women had left the well because she didn't want to run into them. She didn't want to walk up to the hushed conversations and the scornful looks. And so she waited until noon when the sun was hot she didn't go to the well with friends who could help her in withdrawing the water. She went alone because she was trying to avoid people. I'm sure it had been that way in her life for years. This was her life. She avoided social events in public places. She avoided people in a culture that had canceled her. And I'm sure on those occasions when she had to venture out into the public, she avoided eye contact with anyone. You can almost see the pain and loneliness in her downcast eyes as she hurried to the well to draw water alone. How do you not have a heart for someone like that? Well, let me introduce you. Let me talk secondly about the Savior at Jacob's well. This world, I've decided, is full of people like her. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, they're, they're half religious. They have some church background. They know something about the faith. Maybe they once went to church and had some sense of hope that life would be good, but living in this world has wounded them. Maybe they've gone through an unwanted divorce more than once. Maybe they just don't feel they fit in anymore in Jerusalem, in religious circles. People who are just trying to survive, but who feel rejected by the religious Pharisees. People who are the topic of the hushed conversations and who receive the scornful looks because of the misfortunes they faced. 
and now they're thirsty and they're just trying to survive as a modern day Samaritan. Can you imagine the look on her face when she got to that well that day and there sitting at the well was a tired Jewish man? She must have thought, what in the world is he doing here? And as she bowed her head to avoid eye contact and hurried to descend down the steps into the well, she must have been shocked to hear the voice of Jesus ask her, will you give me a drink? <laughs> I mean, her response was no surprise. You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And in parentheses, there's this statement, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Let me tell you, it goes even further than that. And when she points out that you don't have a vessel to draw water from, let me, let me tell you what Jesus is asking for. Because there, if you're reading this in the NIV translation, there's a footnote that explains, uh, it gives a, an alternate rendering of the Greek text right there instead of, for the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans, it would read, for Jews do not use dishes Samaritans have used. You see, Jesus had no vessel to draw the water, but he had no vessel to drink from. He is asking to get a drink of water from this woman's vessel. I'll tell you another secret about your pastor. I'm a little bit of a germ guy. I'm so thankful for hand sanitizer. I wash my hands and, you know, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not a germaphobe. I'm germ conscious. And let me just say, there are some people I don't want to drink after. I can get my own straw or my own glass. Jesus is asking to drink from her vessel. And that was crazy for a Jew. Because to a Jew, any vessel that was used by a Samaritan would be considered dirty or, or, or unclean or polluted. They would never drink from the same cup as a Samaritan. Sir, you don't have anything to draw water with. And she saw that he had no vessel of his own, and that's why she said, how can you ask me for a drink? She didn't understand that she was the vessel. And it wasn't that he just wanted to drink from her cup. It was that he wanted to pour into her cup until she could say like David, my cup runneth over. And Jesus came to the well to make this vessel clean. And I'm so thankful that we have a Savior who meets us at the well to make unclean vessels clean. And that's why he came there. He had to go through Samaria, not because there was no other way to get to where he was going. He went there on purpose, and she was his purpose. He came to make a filthy vessel clean, and she was the vessel. And clean vessels are always ready to be filled, aren't they? And so in verse 10, beginning in verse 10, Jesus has this conversation with her. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for water and he would give you living water. And she thinks he's talking about physical water. You don't have anything to draw water. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Jesus said something astounding. He said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him. This is the filling up part. <laughs> will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And she said, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come and keep drawing water. 
Notice these words with me in this conversation, the gift of God. And if you had known who it is that asked you for a drink, do you understand this water is a gift that is given from God and the only way to receive it is to know who Jesus is that's talking to you at the well. He's more than just a Jewish man. He is hinting to her that he is indeed greater than your father, Jacob, who gave you this well. And so she decides she wants this water, and the conversation gets really interesting about verse 16. Follow me through this, if you will. It seems that Jesus changes the subject. When he says, she says, give me this water, and he says, well, go get your husband and come back. It's interesting how she's learned over the years to cover up her shame with statements like these. I have no husband. I wonder how many times she's had people ask her in public, well, what does your husband do? And she has to hide her shame with these statements that are sort of true, but sort of not. Technically, it's true, but it's really a lie to cover up her shame and to avoid embarrassment. So Jesus confronts her. You're right when you say you have no husband. <clears throat> the fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you say is quite true. Can you imagine the look on her face when a man she has never met reads her life like a book? book. I want to be clear with you about something, and, and you've got to get this. Are you, are, you, are you listening? It is conviction. I, I remember growing up in churches where people had, you know, things like the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of discernment, word of knowledge, uh, gift of prophecy. I remember the evangelist coming to preach, and man, I would just kind of duck down in the pew because I was afraid that he might call me out and read me like a book in front of my parents. I grew up being taught that true conviction leads to repentance. And you see, this world would rather tell you that it's just not sin. It's easier to just redefine sin so that it's not sin anymore. There, we fixed it. No, it's been said the only way to prepare the soil of the heart for the seed is to plow it up with conviction. That was why Jesus told her to go get her husband. He forced her to admit her sin. And there can be no conversion without conviction. There must first be conviction and repentance and then there can be saving faith. And the world simply wants to redefine sin. But the Savior at the well came to the well to set this woman free from her sins, not to cover up her sins. Hallelujah. With Jesus, this conviction, it's not about trying to publicly embarrass you. It's about setting you free and, and making your vessel clean and filling you with living water. And so once Jesus reads her like a book, she says to her, she says to him, uh, sir, I perceive that uh, you must be a prophet. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And when it almost seems that she does what a lot of people do when somebody has their number, she tried to change the subject from her domestic lifestyle to the topic of the theology of worship. And in doing so, she brings the focus back around to the issue of the differences between Jews and Samaritans. And so Jesus makes a bold declaration, whether you are a Samaritan or a Jew. If you're standing at the well, it doesn't matter if you're a Samaritan or a Jew. What Jesus said to her is earth shattering. He said, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. <laughs> Boy, if I didn't know better, I would think Jesus is saying, look, I came, to, I came not to make you Jew or Samaritan. I came to make you saved or lost. <laughs> 
He said the time is coming when, when, when you know, the Messiah is coming. And I'm coming to, the Messiah is coming to save the lost, Jew or Gentile alike. It doesn't matter. And the time has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Jesus is telling this woman, God's not looking for a Samaritan. And he's not looking for a Jew. He's looking for you to worship him in spirit and in truth. And he invited this Samaritan woman to be a true worshiper of God. The last thing I want to talk about is, and I hope you've kind of gotten the picture with me, that the person that we can all relate to in this story is the Samaritan. And if you're at the well as a Samaritan, and you've just had this conversation with the Messiah, I want to talk to you about leaving your water jar at the well. Because this part is about the harvest. At this point in the conversation, we see a seed that had been planted in this woman's heart a long time ago. When she says to Jesus, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. That's a seed that somebody planted in her heart, presumably by someone on the Jewish side of her family. We don't know how exactly she came to know this truth, but it was a seed that had taken root and was about to grow and bear fruit in her life. I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. The word that's translated as explain right there is a Greek word that means to declare or show. And so perhaps for the first time in years, her eyes widened with expectancy and hope, and she takes hold of that seed of truth that somebody told her along the way that one day Messiah will come called Christ, and he will reveal or declare everything. And in essence, she says, Mister, I don't know who you are, but I know that the Messiah is going to do what you just did to me. You know me. I've never met you, but you know my struggles. You know my pain. You know my failures. And you just declared my whole life to me like you know me. Is it possible? Could you be? And that's when Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. Just at this moment, the disciples, remember, they have been gone to get food. And just at this moment, they return just in time to see that at the declaration of Jesus that he is the Christ, this woman left her water jar and took off back to the town and said to the people, and remember, these were the people she probably had tried to avoid. These were people she used to not want to look at in the eye. She went back to those people and she said, you've got to come with me. There's a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be our Savior? And the Bible says that they came out of the town and made their way toward him. I think she, I think she left her water jug for a couple of reasons. For one, I now have this living water <laughs> But secondly, I can imagine that as she left it there, perhaps she said, and grant me a little bit of latitude here, I'll be right back. I think she left her jug there because she planned to come back. I've got to go tell others that Christ has come. If you look at verse 40, uh, 39 
Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior. Can I tell you, if you'll just bring your friends to Jesus... They'll see for themselves. This is about the harvest at the well. You see, when the disciples got back and the woman left her water jar and ran back to town, Jesus had a conversation with the disciples. And the disciples were surprised to see him talking with a woman, which in and of itself was very uncommon in their culture, let alone a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman. Generally, they didn't talk to women in public. A man didn't unless it was a close family member. And this woman was a Samaritan with a complicated domestic life. I imagine her Facebook relationship status would be it's complicated. But the disciples begin to encourage Jesus to eat something, and he tells them, I have food to eat that you don't know of. And they start to wonder if someone had brought him some food, but Jesus says this to him, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then he starts talking to them about the harvest. And I believe that it is at that moment, all of these people from the town are following this woman back out to meet Jesus. And I think it's at that moment that Jesus probably maybe even gestures to, toward those people coming when he says, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the reaper draws his wages. Even now, he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. And listen, he tells them, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. So you see, it's true that this is really about the harvest and the fields truly are ripe for harvest because this woman is full, this world is full of, of women like this, full of people like this, Samaritan woman at the well, people who've been abandoned whose lives make them feel ashamed to be seen in public, people who have been canceled by a culture of hate and scorn, people who are thirsty. But they don't even know what they're thirsty for. The world is full of people like this woman at Jacob's well, and I'm so glad we have a Savior who had to go to Samaria, who waited by the well for me. We have a Savior who came for you. He came to give you living water. By the way, He knows you. In fact, He knows everything about you. Not just everything you ever did, but everything that's ever been done to you. And He still loves you. People with messed up lives like this woman, those are exactly who He came for. He said, I came for those who are sick, destitute, outcasts, the undeserving, the Samaritans people with a socially unacceptable messed up life. There's a prayer I pray very often in my personal prayer life. You know what it is? It's simple. Many years ago, when I first started preaching, and I was green, I had not been to Bible college yet, and I was doing the best I could. I started at a little church across the river from here and they had a prayer team that would meet before the Sunday evening service and pray. 
And one, one night I came out of the, I was a youth pastor there. <laughs> I think I had three people in my youth group. And I came out of that meeting and, and someone said, Brother Todd, can we pray for you? I said, oh yes, by all means. I need all the help I can get. I walked into the prayer room. By the way, there was a chair sitting in the middle of the room. If you walk into a prayer meeting, someone says, can we pray for you? And you walk in and there is a chair sitting in the middle with people gathered around it. <laughs> They're getting ready to really pray for you. <laughs> so I sat down in that chair and they gathered around, laid hands on me. They prayed for boldness because I was an introvert, remember? They prayed for things I didn't even ask them to pray for, but this one person in the prayer group, one of the ladies started having a vision and she was telling what she was seeing. And she said, I see a multitude of people. She said, I see thousands and thousands, of a great multitude of people. And they are all saying, this is the man who told me about you, Lord. He's the one who told me about you, Lord. That's been 36 years ago. And so very often in my living room when I pray, I end my prayer with these words. God, give me the multitude. I don't care if you're Jew or Samaritan. I don't care if you're half religious or whole religious. We'll pray the spirit of religion out of you. <laughs> I pray, God, give me the multitude. How many of you will take up that prayer of your own and pray, God, give me the multitude? Would you stand with me? Bow your heads. I want to speak to our audience through our media ministry and I want to say if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior now is the day now is the time to invite him into your heart he loves you no matter what your life or your social situation Jesus came to your well to find you and to pour living water into you I want to speak to our congregation here in this room if your heads are bowed and you would say pastor I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior, but I want to today. Would you raise your hand? I won't embarrass you, I promise. I won't embarrass you. Anybody that would say, I want to rededicate my life to the Lord, I won't embarrass you, I promise. Let me see your hand. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hallelujah. Let me pray for you. And you join your faith and your hearts with me. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you came to the well to find people like this woman, and you came to find me, and you came to find these people. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that people will invite you right now into their hearts. Lord, come into our hearts and save us. Cleanse us, cleanse our vessel, and pour in the living water. I pray for those watching our program, God, that you will minister to them and strengthen them in the faith, people who are rededicating their lives to you. Let, let there be a fresh pouring in of this living water. And God, I pray that as we, come, as we join our faith together, that you, God, will give us the multitude, whether they be Jew or Samaritan or religious or not, give us the multitude because the harvest is ready. They, it's ripe for the harvest. And Lord, I pray that when we stand before you in the throne room of heaven, we will see all of those that we have harvested standing there with us. Hallelujah. I pray, Lord, a blessing over these people. May your face shine upon them and give them your grace and your favor. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen.